The Chikasa are now settled between the heads of two of the most western branches of Mobile River, and within 12 miles of the eastern main source of Tahrehash, which lower down is called Chokchuma River, as that nation made their first settlements there after they came on the other side of the Mississippi. Where it empties into this, they call it the Yashu. Their tradition says they had 10,000 men fit for war when they first came from the west, and this account seems very probable as they and the Chokta, and also the Chokchuma, who in the process of time were forced by war to settle between the two former nations, came together from the west as one family. The Chickasaw had four large contiguous settlements, which lay nearly in the form of three parts of a square, only that the eastern side was five miles shorter than the western, with the open part toward the Chokta. One was called Yanaka, about a mile wide and six miles long, at the distance of twelve miles from their present towns. Another was ten computed miles long, at the like distance from their present settlements, and from one to two miles broad. The towns were called Shatara, Chukherezo, Haikeha, Tuscawillau, and Falachaho. The other square was single, began three miles from their present place of residence, and ran four miles in length and one mile in breadth. This was called Chukafera, or the Long House, it was more populous than their whole nation contains at present. The remains of this once formidable people make up the northern angle of that broken square. They now scarcely consist of 450 warriors and are settled three miles westward from the deep creek in a clear tract of rich land, about three miles square, running afterward about five miles toward the NW, where the old fields are usually a mile broad. The superior number of their enemies forced them to take into this narrow circle for social defense, and to build their towns on commanding ground at such a convenient distance from one another as to have their enemies when attacked between two fires. Some of the old Nachi Indians who formerly lived on the Mississippi, 200 miles west of the Chocta, told me the French demanded from every one of their warriors the dress buck skin without any value for it, they taxed them but that the warriors' hearts grew very cross and loved the deerskins. According to the French accounts of the Mississippi Indians, this seems to have been in the year 1729. As those Indians were of a peaceable and kindly disposition, numerous and warlike, and always kept a friendly intercourse with the Chickasaw, who never had any goodwill to the French, these soon understood their heart burnings, and by the advice of the old English traders, carried them white pipes and tobacco in their name and that of South Carolina, persuading them with earnestness and policy to cut off the French as they were resolved to enslave them in their beloved land. The Chickasaw succeeded in their embassy, but as the Indians are slow in their counsels on things of great importance, though equally close and intent, it was the following year before they could put their grand scheme into execution. Some of their headmen indeed opposed the plan, yet they never discovered it. But when these went hunting in the woods, the embers burst into a raging flame. They attacked the French, who were flourishing away in the greatest security, and as was affirmed, they entirely cut off the garrison and neighboring settlements, consisting of 1,500 men, women, and children. The misconduct of a few indiscreet persons occasioned so great several innocent lives to be thus cut off. The Nachi afterwards built and settled a strong stockade fort, westward of their old fields, near a lake that communicates with Bayuk Dargent, but the ensuing summer near 2,000 French regulars and provincials, besides a great body of the Chocta and other savages invested it. The besieged sallied on them, with the utmost fury, killed a considerable number, and in all probability would have totally destroyed the white soldiery, but for the sharp opposition of the Chocta in their own method of fighting. The Nachi were at length repulsed, and bombarded with three mortars, which forced them to fly off different ways. The soldiers were too slow-footed to pursue, but the Chocta and other red allies captivated a great number of them and carried them to New Orleans, where several were burned, and the rest sent as slaves to the West India Islands. The greater part, however, went to the Chikasa, where they were secured from the power of their French enemies. The French demanded them, but being absolutely refused, Unluckily for many thousands of them, they formally declared war against the Chikasa. In the open fields, the Chikasa bravely withstood and repelled the greatest combined armies they were able to bring against them, north and south, and gave them and their swarms of red allies several notable defeats.
A body of the Lower French and about 1,400 Chukta attacked the Longhouse town when only 60 warriors were at home. Yet they fought so desperately as to secure themselves, their women, and children, till some of the hunters who had been immediately sent for came home to their assistance, when, though exceedingly inferior in number, they drove them off with great loss. Another time the lower and upper Louisiana French and a great body of red auxiliaries surprised late at night all their present towns, except Amalata, which had about forty warriors, and which stood at some distance from the others. A considerable number of the enemy were posted at every door, to prevent their escape, and what few ran out were killed on the spot. The French seemed quite sure of their prey having so well enclosed it, but at the dawn of day when they were capering and using those flourishes that are peculiar to that volatile nation, the other town drew around them stark naked and painted all over red and black. Thus they attacked them, killed numbers on the spot, released their brethren who joined them like enraged lions, increasing as they swept along, and in their turn encircled their enemies. Their release increased their joy and fury, and they rent the sky with their sounds. Their flashy enemies now changed their boasting tune into O Morbleu and gave up all for lost. Their red allies outhealed them and left them to receive their just fate. They were all cut off but two, an officer and a negro who faithfully held his horse till he mounted, and then ran alongside him. A couple of swift runners were sent after them, who soon came up with them and told them to live and go home and inform their people that as the Chikasa hogs had now plenty of ugly French carcasses to feed on till next year, they hoped then to have another visit from them and their red friends, and that as messengers, they wished them a safe home. They accordingly returned with heavy hearts to the Chickasaw landing place on the Mississippi, at a distance of 170 miles, where they took a boat and delivered their unexpected message. Grief and trembling spread through the country, and the inhabitants could not secure themselves from the fury of these warlike and enraged Chikasa. Every one of their prisoners was put to the fiery torture, without any possibility of redemption. Their hearts were so exceedingly embittered against them. Flushed with this success, many parties turned out against the French, and from time to time hunted them far and near. Some went to the Mississippi, made a fleet of cypress bark canoes, watched their trading boats, and cut off many of them without saving any of the people. The French, finding it impracticable for a few boats to pass those red men of war, were obliged to go in a fleet, carry swivel guns in their long petiogres with plenty of men, but always shunning the Chickasa side of the river and observing the strictest order in their movements by day and in their stations at night. The walking of a wild beast, I have been assured, has frequently called them to their arms and kept them awake for the whole night. They were in so great a dread of this warlike nation. The name of a Chickasaw became as dreadful as it was hateful to their ears. And had it not been more owing to French policy than bravery in uniting all the Mississippi and Canada Indians in a confederacy and enmity against them, Louisiana settlements would have been long since either destroyed or confined to garrisons. When any of the French armies made a tolerable retreat, they thought themselves very happy. Once, when the impression was pretty much worn out of their minds, and wine inspired them with new stratagems and hopes of better success, a great body of them, mixed with a multitude of savages, came to renew their attack. But as their hostile intentions were early discovered, the Chickasaw had built a range of strong stockade forts on the ground which could not safely be approached, as the contiguous land was low, and chanced then to be wet. A number of the French and their allies drew near the western fort, but in the manner of hornets, flying about to prevent their enemies from taking a true aim, while several ranks followed each other in a slow and solemn procession, like white-robed, tall, midnight ghosts, and as if fearless and impenetrable. The Indians did not at first know what sort of animals they were, for several shots had been fired among them, without incommoding them or retarding their direct course to the fort. As they advanced nearer, the Chickasaw kept a continual fire at them, with a sure aim, according to their custom. This was with as little success as before, contrary to every attempt they had ever made before against their enemies. 
The warriors concluded them to be wizards, or old French men carrying the Ark of War against them. In their council, they were exceedingly perplexed, but just as they had concluded to oppose some of their reputed prophets to destroy the power of those cunning men or powerful spirits of the French, those uncommon appearances spread themselves in battle along the south side of the fort and threw hand granados into the fort. Amid the night they decamped and saved themselves by a well-timed retreat, left the Chickasaw triumphant and inspired them with the fierceness of so many tigers which the French often fatally experienced far and near, till the late session of West Florida to Great Britain. I have two of these shells, which I keep with veneration, as speaking trophies over the boasting messieurs and their bloody schemes. In the year 1748, the French sent a party of their Indians to storm some of the Chickasaw traders' houses. They accordingly came to my trading house first, as I lived in the frontier, Finding it too dangerous to attempt to force it, they padded with their hands a considerable time on one of the doors, as a decoy, imitating the earnest rap of the young women who go a-visiting that time of night. Finding their labor in vain, one of them lifted a billet of wood and struck the side of the house, where the women and children lay, to frighten them and awake me, my mastiffs had been silenced with their venison." At last, the leader went ahead with the beloved Ark and pretended to be directed by the divine oracle to watch another principal trader's house. They accordingly made for it, when a young woman, having occasion to go out of the house, was shot with a bullet that entered behind one of her breasts and through the other, ranging the bone. She suddenly wheeled round and tumbled down within the threshold of the house. The brave trader instantly bounded up, sounding the war whoop, and in a moment grasped his gun and rescued her. The Indian physician also, by his skill in simples, soon cured her. As so much hath been already said of the Chickasaw in the accounts of the Chirake, Muscoga, and Chocta, with whose history theirs was necessarily interwoven, my brevity here, I hope, will be excused. The Chickasaw live in as happy a region as any under the sun. It is temperate, as cool in summer as can be wished, and but moderately cold in winter. There is frost enough to purify the air, but not to chill the blood, and the snow does not lie four and twenty hours together. This extraordinary benefit is not from its situation to the equator, for the Chirake country, among the Apalachi Mountains, is colder in a surprising degree, but from the nature and levelness of the extensive circumjacent lands, which in general are very fertile. They have no running stream in their present settlement. In their old fields they have banks of oyster shells, at the distance of four hundred miles from the seashore, which is a visible token of a general deluge when it swept away the loose earth from the mountains by the force of a tempestuous northeast wind, and thus produced the fertile lands of the Mississippi, which probably was the sea before that dreadful event. As the Chickasaw fought the French and their red allies, with the utmost firmness, in defense of their liberties and lands, to the very last, without regarding their decay, only as an incentive to revenge their losses. Equity and gratitude ought to induce us to be kind to our steady old friends, and only purchase so much of their land as they would dispose of for value. With proper management, they would prove extremely serviceable to a British colony on the Mississippi. I hope no future misconduct will alienate their affections, after the manner of the superintendent's late deputy which hath been already mentioned." The skillful French could never confide in the Choctaw, and we may depend on being forced to hold hot disputes with them in the infant state of the Mississippi settlements. It is wisdom to provide against the worst events that can be reasonably expected to happen. The remote inhabitants of our northern colonies are well acquainted with the great value of those lands from their observations on the spot. The soil and climate are fit for hemp, silk, indigo, wine, and many other valuable productions which our merchants purchase from foreigners, sometimes at a considerable disadvantage. The range is so good for horses, cattle, and hogs that they would grow large and multiply fast, without the least occasion of feeding them in winter, or at least for a long space of time, because of the numberless branches of reeds and canes that are interspersed, with nuts of various kinds. Rice, wheat, oats, barley, Indian corn, fruit trees, and kitchen plants would grow to admiration. As the ancients tell us, Bacchus Amet Montes, so grape vines must thrive extremely well on the hills of the Mississippi, for they are so rich as to produce winter canes, 
contrary to what is known at any distance to the northward. If British subjects could settle West Florida in security, it would in a few years become very valuable to Great Britain, and they would soon have as much profit as they could desire to reward their labor. Here, 500 families would in all probability be more beneficial to our mother country than the whole colony of North Carolina, besides innumerable branches toward Ohio and Monongahela. Enemies to the public good may enter caveats against our settling where the navigation is precarious, and the extraordinary kindness of the late ministry to the French and Spaniards prevented our having an exclusive navigation on the Mississippi. Aberville might still become a valuable mart to us, and from New Orleans it is only three miles to St. John's Creek, where people pass through the Lake of St. Louis and embark for Mobile in Pensacola. The Spaniards have wisely taken advantage of our misconduct by fortifying Louisiana and employing the French to conciliate the affections of the savages, while our legislators, fermented with the corrupt lees of false power, are striving to whip us with scorpions. As all the Florida Indians have grown jealous of us since we settled East and West Florida, are unacquainted with the great power of the Spaniards in South America, and have the French to polish their rough Indian politics, Louisiana is likely to prove more beneficial to them than it did to the French. They are fortifying their Mississippi settlements like a new Flanders, and their French artists, on account of our ministerial lethargy, will have a good opportunity, if a European war should commence, to continue our valuable Western barriers as wild and waste as the French left them. The war like Chickasaw proved so formidable to them that, except for a small settlement above New Orleans, which was covered by the Choctaw Bounds, they did not attempt to make any other on the eastern side of the Mississippi below Illinois though it contains such a vast tract of fine land, as would be sufficient for four colonies of 250 miles square. Had they been able by their united efforts to have destroyed the Chickasaw, they would not have been idle, for in that case, the Choctaw would have been soon swallowed up by the assistance of their other allies, as they never supplied them with arms and ammunition, except those who went to war against the Chickasaw. From North Carolina to the Mississippi, the land near the sea is, in general, low and sandy, and it is very much so in the two colonies of Florida, to a considerable extent from the seashore shore when the lands appear fertile, level, and diversified with hills. Trees indicate the goodness or badness of land. Pine trees grow on sandy, barren ground, which produces long, coarse grass. The adjacent lowlands abound with canes, reeds, or bay and laurel of various sorts, which are shaded with large expanding trees. They compose an evergreen thicket, mostly impenetrable to the beams of the sun, where the horses, deer, and cattle chiefly feed during the winter, and the panthers, bears, wolves, wildcats, and foxes resort there, both for the sake of prey and a cover from the hunters. Lands of loose black soil, such as those of the Mississippi, are covered with fine grass and herbage and well shaded with large and high trees of hickory, ash, white, red, and black oaks, great towering poplars, black walnut trees, sassafras, and vines. The low wetlands adjoining the rivers chiefly yield very large cypress trees and of a prodigious height. On the dry grounds are plenty of beech, maple, holly, the cotton trees, with a prodigious variety of other sorts. But we must not omit the black mulberry tree, which likewise is plenty. It is high, and if it had proper air and sunshine, the boughs would be very spreading. On the fruit, the bears and wildfowl feed during their season, and also swarms of parakeets, enough to deafen one with their chattering in the time of those joyful repasts. I believe the white mulberry tree does not grow spontaneously in North America.